So you just imagine you did the floor plan, and then you set it aside and you use it as if it were in the wild, right? That's what terminology we tend to use for it is we say we're going to set the model loose in the wild. You think about training something and then you think about it being sort of deployed into a operational space, you want to ensure that what you trained it to do, training and the testing, is very similar, right? But they're both very poor. So the, the underfitting is kind of best described by, it hasn't quite fallen victim to the, the amount of we're going to use it. I'm going to use another term here. We're going to discuss it. This one sucks. I'm not going to lie. Okay? Variance is used in multiple different ways in the data science discipline, and I don't like it, but I have to teach you how it's used. When I came across it, I'm like, I, this is confusing. What are we talking about? Okay? So there is variance within the data set, and there is variance between data sets. The variance between data sets can be seen as the differential in performance characteristics, right? It is the delta between average accuracy, or MSE, from training testing. We would say that it is variable relative to the data set that it's being asked to perform on. So in an underfitting scenario, we say that the variance is low, but the accuracy is also low. However, if we get down to this portion here, the accuracy is high, but what also happens? The variance is also high, right? So while training accuracy increases, it's the performance delta between similar sets is evaluated <coughs> by comparison of the model being, or a mo the model evaluating the representative set. So the linear relationship here indicates that we actually probably don't have quite enough total flexibility in order to be able to capture the data variance, right? So the characteristics of the data that are present or descriptive characteristics, the spread, the values over which they're put. This is the reason why I think that the idea of the two variances is kind of not so great. But it is, like I said, this. I like to say sort of variability. That's another way I'll say it. So I say it has variability in performance between the sets. Now let's look at another model, and let's look at the performance characteristics relative to the uh, linear model and a, 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 a cubic spline, basically. This is going to be a third order model. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this one, because this one, once again, is hard to see even without actually kind of zooming in and seeing what's going on, because Colors are kind of uh, pretty close to one another and overlap a lot. But the linear model shown in yellow, the cubic spline shown in blue, which has just a little bit of flexibility. Okay, this is actually a constrained cubic spline. This is not just a strict cubic interpolation. We'll talk about how we use cubic splines to create uh, variable flexibility. We can create uh, artificial degrees of freedom. Right, so you have something that's like a 2.15 degree of freedom line by constraining the amount that the, the cubic can change over its, its surface. What we're going to look at here is the immediate break between that strict cubic and something slightly higher order, which ultimately starts to immediately capture values that are very much anecdotal, right? They do not reflect the underlying curve, they, they are captured largely because of the fact that the model needs to continue to reduce total error because you've given it the flexibility to do so and you've asked it to minimize the function, right? What's the objective function of our regression? Minimizing MSC, minimizing the distance between the points. So when I allow the system additional memory, additional parameters to adjust, based upon that objective function, when I evaluate the system, I go, okay, well, it's not, it's not doing what I want it to do. No, it's doing exactly what you told it to. It just doesn't have any additional constraints to keep it honest in this process. So without, the, without additional constraints, high dimensionality models fall victim very quickly to substantial variance characteristics in 
the, in the relationship between these spaces. All right. Next one is slightly higher order than what we were looking at beforehand. And it's interesting to me because I, this curve always makes me happy. Okay. Why does the curve make me happy? Because you have initially some small delta between the training and testing performance. And then immediately as you start increasing flexibility, what happens to that model? It's, it's learning very quickly, right? It's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping. The error is, is going, like the error is going to the floor very quickly. And it keeps doing so. Also, we notice that it's parallel. We don't have any divergence happening. So the parallelity of what, what we're seeing there is generalization. That the rules that it's learning from the training set, it's able to widely and easily apply to the testing set, and they maintain consistent performance in that space. It is only after about 10 degrees of freedom that the model starts to hit a little bit of a gap, right? Where we start to notice a subtle transition and subtle divergence. Notice it's not as extreme as what we saw beforehand. The, but by the time we get to 10th order, we are actually kind of leveling out around that time anyway, right? So where there's potentially that, that the performance of the training set is continuing to decrease. Now, what's one of the interesting things that can happen here, I want to point this out, is that if your training set performance continues to decrease, and your testing set performance does not get substantially worse, keep training. Keep increasing the flexibility. Because there's always a possibility that you can find something that we call epoch learning, which is where occasionally you'll, you'll find another region where they start to move together again. So we can have certain circumstances in which the learning process appears to freeze up for a while, and it starts doing some memorization or overfitting and then it will break loose of that process. So what is, what is one of the main reasons why we look at these whole graphs is because we want to understand the performance after they hit that critical point and see whether or not something else happens again later on. Now it's not incredibly common with low order systems for something like that to happen where it sort of break out and start learning again. <coughs> we'll talk about how we utilize that approach of sort of trying to get the system to break out of its core uh, loop and establish a, uh, another approach to the process. So we use, uh, we use tools to sort of drive the, the learning process in stochastic models. So these strictly deterministic models, you know, where we're, we're doing strict regression-based systems, don't have quite the flexibility. But um, it says here the truth is wiggly and the noise is relatively low, right? That's one of the reasons why this one works. Being the noise being low means that the relative uh, area, the interval around which the values set is not going to imply a lot of uh, variance as a result of irreducible error, okay? So the variance we say, the model variance there, we're talking about performance differences between sets. When we say their beta, we're actually talking about the variance that is due to that irreducibility in the, of, of the error space. That is a result of noisy characteristics and process variability. So process variability is just the idea that you can't ever create or conduct two things of identical order at the same time, right? They're not going to both occur simultaneously. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to talk about something called the bias variance trade off. This is a, no, another way of looking at the equation that we first looked at and discussing some of the, some of the constraints. All right. One of the constraints here is that, like the irreducible error, we can only get so much out of what we have available. We can only adjust the parameters until they optimize, and then we're beyond that, we're not able to do any additional adjustment. Here we see a version of, of NSE, all right? So this, this is essentially NSE for 
uh, in the singular, right? So this is a singular error assessment, but we can extend this to MSEs, but we'll just go ahead and look at a single error value right now. So we say that the performance for an op observation from a population is assessed with true model characteristics, and then we are going to look at the minimization of the objective function for y. We're going to then say that that value is assessed by the, the median, the arithmetic mean of the values prescribed for some x as the square of the difference between the two, the total magnitude of error. I can decompose that total magnitude of error as a result of looking back up above into two components. Variance is a result of model parameterization, and then biasing characteristics as a result of the square of the model characterization. Now, I also have variance as a result of the irreducible error, right? We could also say that the irreducible error variance is similar to the standard deviation and mean shift characteristics of the data, data sets. So let me ask you this, if I have one data set that has 100% of the points, and then I randomly select 30% of those points, and then I keep the other 70%, that's my, my testing or training set, and then my testing set's my 30% 30 point, 30 of the points, and I perform a statistical analysis on them, right? I have the original distribution of the original data set, and then I randomly resample both of them. What are the what do the distributions of the data sets look like? They're not identical, right? The random sampling process should imply that the 30% reserved for testing purposes should have roughly the same variance characteristics, but will not have identical characteristics. Likewise, the 70% that's used in the training will not be identical to the original data set because of the fact that those 30% of points have been removed, and now it has a slightly different set of characteristics regarding its, its spread over the values and the total number of values that are being expressed in the space. So those characteristics that we use to describe distributions and likelihood assessments are going to be adjusted by our synthetic removal of samples for the purpose of future testing. So what we're actually looking at here is the differential performance with respect to the calculative system such that it says the expected average over variability of why not as well as the variability in training conform to the variance as a result of our assessment F0. So a biasing term here, note that the bias can be reconstructed as the difference between the expected value of our guess function and the actual underlying system. What's the problem with that? Well, we never know that. We're never actually able to calculate because of the fact that we can't know the ideal function. It is only theoretical that I state that the bias of the system is actually a response of the difference between my guess and the output value. Now, what is this also saying? Because I'm using expected value, I'm saying it is the relationship between the mean of the training set and the mean of the actual underlying system. Biasing term, when I said previously that beta naught from our previous equation was a biasing term, it moves the line up and down relevant to where that cluster of points is. As I said, since we can resample that cluster of points, imagine the mean of that cluster of points for the training is now up here, and the mean for the testing is slightly down here. That biasing term, the coefficient, is going to slightly offset between the data used in the training and the true underlying distribution. This creates a problem that says that as flexibility increases for our guess function at hat, the variance, its variance increases, but its bias decreases. Now, what do we see here? Why do we say that the bias decreases? Well, because the more flexibility that I provide 
the better this is going to get in comparison to the core, actual core function, right? I'm giving it more capacity to fit to the data. But what happens whenever I give you more capacity to fit to the data? I reduce the error, but at the same time, I create set dependency. So this idea of set dependency is a characteristic of increasing variance. So as the variance increases, the error reduces overall, right? The bias itself is actually going to decrease. But the variance, the train to test performance, is going to increase. This is not a resolvable situation. Right, hold on a second. I don't think that the one. Yeah, the one they have here is broken. Give me a second. Um, I have a, uh, I have another um, image here. So supplemental slides. I think you guys can see supplemental slides on Canvas as well. systematically incorrect decision, but you can still be precise and still have high bias. So that's one of the things that happens in, in this situation is that you can maintain relatively low variance, but have low accuracy. This is actually an underfitting case, because while performance in the training versus testing environment would be relatively consistent, right, there would be minimized variance. There's also minimum bias, so it's a situation where we haven't actually achieved the desired results. High bias, high bias and high variance is a useless model, right? That is, that is a model where I have overfit entirely, right? Because the performance characteristics would be only applicable for the training set, yes? It, uh, it's also to be underfit like high bias, high variance. High bias and high variance doesn't really exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist, but low it, bias, low variance also doesn't really exist. exist. This is a trade-off space, yeah. and we're going to look at how the trade-off space works. This is the theoretical underpinning to the ideal. Because guess what? This is still one-dimensional. We're not comparing training and testing. This doesn't compare training and testing. This just shows maybe what training would be or what testing, testing would be as a result of a specific kind of training. 
So without the comparison between these two things, we can't really make a determination between how that trade-off works. Now let's look at something here. We will look eventually at how points are sort of settled on lines and how they're co-associated. You could look at the clustering. But uh, these concepts are linked more towards classification in some spaces. When I say classification usually does a better job, so that's the reason why over there on the right-hand side, I'm showing a classification solution. This is a strictly linear model system that has high bias and thus is underfitting. Right? Even if I showed you samples that had roughly the same distributional characteristics, you would see that they would largely fit that same curvature. Thus, that line is not going to be sufficient to encapsulate the information contained. Likewise, I have the actual parameterization of some border between two classes of objects. And I have a few samples that occur in the adjacent regions. Now, why could that be? Just variance, right? Some things don't occur exactly where they're supposed to. Sometimes our collection processes aren't quite right. So occurring in the, across the border is not necessarily a thing that seems totally unbelievable. So the samples, the red samples that are inside the blue and the blue samples that are inside the red, those are just reasonable degrees of error that I'm gonna have to compensate for. They are irreducible. With respect to the actual underlying function, if I was to perfectly fit f of x, right, the true f of x with my f hat, with my guess function, if my bias went to nothing, I got a perfect level of accuracy, I end up with the green line, okay? The green line has low bias, but incredibly high variance because new samples that are gonna come in and try to use the green line as the border of separation, what do we think is gonna happen? There's gonna be a lot of samples that are gonna be on the wrong side of the tracks when it comes to that. So by making these determinations on singular examples, this is a situation in which we have to go with the stoic axiom, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. When we get too focused on trying to adapt the individual singular examples for our system, we lose the overarching objective of having a system that can provide us with utility both for the existing data. We do want the model to perform well in training, but that is almost a given, okay? As long as it performs well enough, the training will always converge to the ideal solution relative to the flexibility that we give it. However, we're concerned more about the testing performance. If there is anything, any singular metric that we should use to assess the performance of the model, it would be testing, because testing performance is likely never to exceed training performance. It would take a really, really weird set of circumstances or a model be constructed on training data, perform worse on the training data, and then perform better on the testing data for that to happen. Right? I think you can see, I hope you can see why that would be the case. That it would be an incredibly weird circumstance that I would learn, sort of, I would learn the right process by the wrong methodology. That would be essentially the, the way of saying it. So what we look at here is this is very similar to that. Uh, system we had previously, but this is sort of the labeled version of the diagram from the spatial labeled version. The uh, optimal order system is our objective, where we're having, where we're meeting a trade-off set point. Selection error is going to be testing error. All right, I don't know why they use the term selection in this particular graph, but I like it because it's clean. All right, you can find a lot of these graphs that are cluttered up with junk, so this one's just clean enough for us. But training error continues to reduce past appropriate levels of model order into the overfitting space. But this is what we're actually interested in. Systems of model complexity have, as a result of this curve of total error, a performance, a, a converging set of performance curves. One being the bias of the system, which is essentially the total error, and the other one being the variance of the system, which is the set-to-set -set dependency characteristic. So initially, our error is relatively high, but it's consistent across both data sets, right? It's, it's high, but generalized. 
as I continue down the slope of, uh, of error, right, increasing in accuracy as error reduces, what's happening to the graph of the variance of the differentiation between tra the training testing? It's, yeah. it's starting to go up slowly. Now, this isn't always exactly how it goes. This is a, this is a theoretical curvature because we know that it shifted and we know that the places that it moves are shifted relative to this differential, right? Because we have the chain trade-off between the training error and the testing error. We're missing training error and testing error. It's really confusing to try to put training and testing error and bias variance on the same graph. It looks that what ends up happening is testing error sort of fits the upper curvature on the total error curve and then the uh, training error tends to fit the bias curve, right? It tends to go just to flatten that down. The only time you see a comparison or a value comparison that works well with this is that the variance, when, when, it, when the uh, testing error significantly diverges, it starts to get in alignment with that, that variance curve. But total error, what is total error? It's training and testing performance combined, right? Now, why is it to see that we see total error going back up? Well, only a fraction of the error, only 70% of it or so, is in the training set. Once the training set plateaus in terms of its total ability to match the error, once it fits to the model, and then even once it overfits to the model, guess what? It can't get any more accurate. However, the testing error can get as bad as it wants. <laughs> Essentially, the testing error can go to infinity, right? Because you could have a theoretical massive amount of, of, of testing error. So that's what's happening here, is that combined, both of them, the error is decreasing. This is the learning curve of the model. The model is learning during this stage. What's happening after that point, after this critical point here, Right? Where the accuracy has reached a minimum without sacrificing variability between the models is going to be where we establish via this is, I guess you could say this in some senses is an objective measurement. Because we do end up with a unique value, a known value, relative to the models that we have tried to determine which one has the best performance characteristics amongst the models that we've, uh, that we've tested or we've trained on the training model and then tested by this evaluation process. So we develop an array of models with varying flexibility, right? The term model complexity is used here. I like to use graphs that have different versions of the same word that show up with the same thing because it gets you used to the idea of they're interchangeable with one another. Model complexity is flexibility. And also, it is the degrees of freedom of that model, how many parameters that model has. So in a sense, we say the model's memory is also tied up in the model complexity. Depending on how many spaces you allow for the parameter, you can have a lot of the characteristics of that data are now encapsulated. They've been captured by and are now represented by the model itself. So when we say that the model actually becomes like a distillation, anybody know what the distillation process, right? Do we remember that from chemistry, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you, you distill a chemical out by differentiation. This learning process is like a distillation. You're getting the important part away from the part you don't want. So the model becomes the embodiment of the underlying value the information theory driven aspect of it, right? So information theory says that underneath of data is information. So when we get at the information and we extract that information, we go from that scope where we say intelligence, knowledge, you know, or excuse me, a broad information, knowledge, actual intelligence. When we get the intelligence out of that system, that is when we have created a model from the raw data, right? We have, we have a useful deployable system. But if that system is super, super good at fitting to our intelligence, but then does not tell us anything about the future because of the fact that beyond the scope of its immediate knowledge, it is not effective, then we have 
lost the point. We've lost the threat. We, have, we are no longer capturing the information characteristics of the data. We're now actually just sort of saving all of the unique parameter characteristics of the raw information. The bias variance dilemma is encapsulated in that. You don't let the model have too much freedom because it will use its freedom to cheat. It doesn't have, it's, a, it's like Terminator. It doesn't think, it doesn't feel, it doesn't have any morality, right? It just, it just does what it's designed to do. It's just, you know, it's, it's out there trying to get to its objective. That's what these models are. We have to realize that they're not sort of, they're not wrong for that because they're doing what they're designed for. But at the same time, we are required to be able to sit and kind of crank them just enough. It's the reason why there is still a huge call for data science in the world. We see so much automation happening in a lot of spaces, but there's still call for data science because this there's an art and a science to this. I'm not going to lie about that. There's an art to this. Learning how this works, being able to read some of these graphs, making reasonable adjustments, is a component of this particular craft. All right. Uh, we've largely gone through this. Let's talk briefly about classification problems as an overview. We won't get these get these until uh, chapter four for the most part, but we will be talking a little bit about classification going in. The different, the, the primary difference between classification, and we saw just a simple classification graph is that the line, rather than being a predictor of the next likely value in the space, predicts the median of the likelihood for the value space. Essentially, instead of predicting a singular example, or the likelihood of the example for that space, it predicts the boundary, or the decision surface. Okay? We'll also call that the discriminant. There's many, many, some of these things have many names, all right? So the discriminant surface is the one in which we discriminate. We tell the difference between two things. And discrimination is bad, right? But, but it's also good because we use it for classification. We actually are constantly discriminating between things, right? So when we say discrimination is a form of bias, that's a sociopolitical argument. That's using those terms in the sociopolitical sense. Right, don't get confused on that. I've had students in the past who try to answer sociopolitical answers to things like bias and variance and discrimination. They go, oh yeah, discrimination's bad because it puts people in the wrong categories. And it's like, no, that's not, that's not this. This is different learning, right? Discriminant is a good thing because that's where we tell what fits in what category. If it's a bad discriminant, yeah, fine, I got, I'll give you that. It's not a good one, it's not useful. We could say that a system could overfit the data, right? You could look at an anecdotal example, like a bad experience that you had with somebody with a, a, in a specific ethnic group, and you would sort of anecdotally overfit to that specific experience, and thus your discriminant, your boundary about making decisions in that case would be in fact heavily biased toward the direction, right? But it's not the same kind of bias because we use bias term to indicate that you fit to the data. But in reality, you're fitting only to specific anecdotal examples. All right, variable y, in the case of classification, uses a qualitative assessment, not a quantitative assessment. Regression previously provided for us the mean value associated with a region. It was calculating its value, its, its interpolated or extrapolated value based upon the previous data, and it gave you a number relative to an input. If you put in x equals four, it gave you y equals 2.175, okay? That valuation was a unique characteristic. That was a quantitative value. A qualitative value says you are in this class or you're not in this class, right? It is a, a binary discriminant can be the most primitive of a system, in or out of the group yellow or red, blue or green, right? You're in one category or not. The whole valuation of a qualitative assessment for a labeling process adds a little bit of complexity for us whenever we use it in some systems, all right? So we import data into something like R or Python or something else. We have to convert those qualitative vectors into some form of, of uh, numerical designation, right? We, we often convert those into like a vector 
that contains numerical equivalencies. So that conversion of a qualitative vector into a quantitative associated vector is a digital class version that's provided here, right? The classes provided in this space are spam and ham, right? Or emails, good and bad emails, or a class of digits. And a class of digits can be given as you know, zero through nine for a visual classification system. So we want to assign, with classification, we want to assign the appropriate class from the class label category to the appropriate independent observation label within the array X, within the sample space X. That, that value can have a variety of different dimensions to it, just like our other feature vectors, but the uh, qualitative label, the qualitative target, is still singular, right? So things, we tend to look at it from this perspective of saying that we have a, we have, we'll pick one part of the descriptive characteristics of something to predict utilizing the remainder of the elements. So you can predict any qualitative characteristic or should be able to predict any qualitative characteristic of a data set using the remainder of the features of those individuals. You guys ever heard of the game, ever seen the game Guess Who? Right, you guys know what I'm talking about? It's where you have the, the little tiles and you have the people and you, you say, I, does that have glasses, do they have dark hair, whatever else, and you, mm -hmm. got, you, you pick them out, okay? Those are features. What you're performing there is a complex discriminant analysis to be able to determine whether they're in class or out of class from the group that you're looking for. Ultimately, you're looking to narrow your scope into a single individual or at least a binary choice. But the objective of that process is the same. Identify characteristics, identify features that divide the group. And usually, what's the, the best way to play that? What would be the best way to play that? Ask questions about features that eliminate the largest number of possible options. So you want to narrow the scope either to eliminate a small group or to eliminate a large group. Either way can be a good option. And you can keep narrowing, you can keep reducing through that process. So when we say that uncertainties are assessed, that we're looking for valuation of determinacy based upon adjacency. You can put something in a class, and see that it's clearly there, and if you have, let's say it's a long ways from the boundary, a long ways from the border, you go, okay, obviously that's within, hard within this class. However, if you bring it back toward the boundary between the options, then you always have that degree of uncertainty. So what we tend to look at is that we adjust the value of our, of our uh, boundary or discriminant boundary of our classification uh, a, a function to be able to provide us with improved accuracy on things that are in the border space, right? Between the areas where there might be the highest variance in that particular operation. All right, um, how we do this often is by a down projection or, or uh, binarization of spatial information. The example here is that if we had a series of, of value plots and then we projected some of those values up onto the upper axis and some onto the lower axis, we could create a line, a linear boundary in between the two class groups to be able to tell at what value you are most likely to convert from being in an orange category into a blue category. This one's a little bit difficult. I have another better visualization that I'm planning on showing you guys next week that should kind of clear this up a little bit. But we do a lot of this situation where we take like a cluster plot and then we're going to reproject it onto its relevant axes. And part of this original assessment, this discussion of linear methods of separation. So instead of utilizing, let's look here at this equation real quick. Let's ignore this graph for the moment, other than if you, want, if you think you get it, good, by all means. But let's look at the equation first. We have k elements, all right? k elements are members of C class. So we will say that C is of uh, cardinality K, right? It has, it, the, sets, the set of elements C has contained within it unique designations K. I will then apply that understanding of K 
to y of k. So the probability here, this probability assessment is saying the likelihood of y being k for some individual value of x is the core of this Go of this goal, right? So the goal of classification is to describe for us or to, to provide us with an assessment of the likelihood that some sample is a member of some class. Now, everybody has a rough understanding of Bayes' theorem, I, I'm assuming, right? Bayesian probability? Right. Well, if you haven't seen it, it's fine. We'll, we'll go through it and we'll talk about it at least in brief. But essentially, this process of establishing the probability of the class likelihood involves a, a multi-stage process. I must determine first how many things there are per unit volume, and then I must determine based upon the localization of a specific sample, how likely it is to be a member of a specific class. So by previous experience, I can learn from future or for future application via the use of this data extraction methodology. I can draw probabilistic relationships and use those probabilistic relationships for future <coughs> implementation, future deployment. We say that the conditional probabilities are related to a Bayesian optimal classifier that is given by the equation listed below. C of x, an assignment of a specific tag or specific class to be assigned to a value x, is equal to the j element if the probability of the j element of x is in fact the max for all probabilities for all k elements of c. Is that confusing? I check the probability of it being in each of the classes. I say, is it likely red? Is it likely green? Is it likely blue? Is it likely yellow? I have an array, and I say whichever one has the highest likelihood of being, then I will assign it to that class grouping. This maximization function just says, run p of x, right, for pk, for all k classes. How many classes do we have? Well, we have as many as we have a, a qual qualitative designation, right? Let's say that this is just simply three colors, red, green, and blue, all right? So k has three elements. C has three classes. What we're going to do is we're going to test a single sample based upon its position within the space that we're analyzing. We're going to say, based upon the RGB value of that, of that pixel, we're going to group it into RG and B. We do so by comparing it and saying, well, how much is it likely to be a B? How much is it likely to be a G? And how much is it likely to be an R? You go, oh, well, the R probability, the valuation of R probability, which is the likelihood, the total value likelihood over the adjacency value, provides me with the likelihood is optimal, maximal in that R class. I'm just going to assign that particular value, the or that particular sample, the class that is associated with the highest probability of membership. All right, very sufficiently confused? All right, keep thinking about it. I will continue on with this. This one's not super difficult once we start to break it down, but we're, we're still at the high level. We're looking at it from a very high level looking down. So um, we could use, let, let's look here real quick at this. We could use a nearest neighbor association. Let's take that into example. Let's say that I have a cluster of red over here, right, and a cluster of green over here. I have a new sample that falls somewhere kind of in between red and green. I can use the previous knowledge of where red and green are based upon the localization to determine based upon the density of those clusters of information, right? That gives me a probability density estimate. And then I determine based upon the localization the distance from the means of those samples relative to their, their spread I get a probability assessment of the likelihood of that sample being either a member of green or a member of red. That's how I'm going to do my co-association. I do that metric, I do that measurement of all relative clusters that are within the space of the system, and then whichever one is the highest likelihood, I'm going to assess it. We do this constantly. The difference is we don't think about how we think. 
So this is one of the circumstances where I'm teaching you something and, or I'm talking with you about something that you guys already know intuitively because you do this, you've done this since you were a child, right? Grouping things, clustering things together based upon prior knowledge and information is critical to learning. So when we're doing this process, understand these processes are established based upon things that we've observed from the way humans think, and our best efforts are encapsulated in our mechanisms of how we try to replicate human thought and human learning. Right, strong AI, the, core, the goal of strong AI is to create something that thinks like a human, because we assume that if it thinks like a human, we can give it all of our jobs and we can just sit back and be lazy. Okay. That's the ultimate goal of AI is to have a you know, perfectly valid uh, excuse to not have to do anything anymore. So um, that can be the remainder. I will put out a, um, a lab, if we left two, you guys are gonna have roughly a week to be able to finish that. It's gonna correspond with some regression and some introductory material on uh, data management. It is pretty automated and I'm going to try to record a little uh, panopto explaining how some of those elements works. Um, there is a little R cheat sheet that's on, uh, on Canvas. If you're interested about that, like interested about just kind of how that works, print that baby out and then that way you can go and look and see what the commands you have available are if you want to do some additional stuff. I would like you to try to implement some additional graphing mechanisms so that you can have other visualizations. So part of the assignment will be related to continuing on. You'll do that, you'll do the lab, and then you'll continue on a little bit to doing a few things on your own to graph and provide some value uh, analytics for an additional data set, the auto data set from the uh, from the textbook data. Okay, any questions on anything we've covered today? All right, thank you very much. Yes. Is there going to be a link or information on where to go and download all of it? Oh, um, yeah, okay. I have a little, uh, I have a little thing I was going to do. Um, okay. Yeah. And can I use Python? The... Is it you? But I have used MATLAB. I have used MATLAB. You're using, I have a, 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 a senior design buddy who's in 416, which is, sounds very similar to this class, and they're using math for neuroreactive systems. Oh, neuroreactive systems is not the same. Oh, it's not? He said it sounded a lot like this class. It starts off with it. It starts off with it. Okay. I, I, we will get to the girl in the depth of the at the end of the class. And here. Actually, actually we'll, we'll, cover, we'll break it up and we're going to cover it in two parts. Because I realize I'm going to do a sarcastic method version earlier on than we want to do a sarcastic Neural networks are not deterministic, right? Okay. So a completely different setup and everything. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. the notation is very different. Yeah, you'll find it's, it's a good tool. But I honestly, I honestly have been on to uh, so that the instructor for that class is my former title. Oh, I, I, I had Dr. D teach me uh, my logics class, and he was like, I normally don't teach this, and I think it's the only semester. And I could tell very quickly that, yes, he is used to teaching higher level courses. <laughs> Much higher level courses, because 